the night was spent in gloomy forebodings. What the result of our captivity would be, it was out of our power to determine or even imagine. At times we could almost realise the approach of our masters to butcher and scalp us. Again we could nearly see the pile of wood kindled on which we were to be roasted, and then we would imagine ourselves at liberty, alone and defenceless in the forest, surrounded by wild beasts that were ready to devour us. The anxiety of our minds drove sleep from our eyelids, and it was with a dreadful hope and painful impatience that we waited for the morning to determine our fate. The morning at length arrived, and our masters came early and let us out of the house, and gave the young man and boy to the French who immediately took them away. Their fate I never learned, as I have not seen nor heard of them since. I was now left alone in the fort, deprived of my former companions, and of everything that was near or dear to me but life. But it was not long before I was in some measure relieved by the appearance of two pleasant-looking squaws of the Seneca tribe, who came and examined me attentively for a short time, and then went out. After a few minutes' absence they returned with my former masters, who gave me to them to dispose of as they pleased. The Indians by whom I was taken were a party of Shawanese, if I remember right, that lived, when at home, a long distance down the Ohio. My former Indian masters, and the two squaws, were soon ready to leave the fort, and accordingly embarked. The Indians in a large canoe, and the two squaws and myself in a small one, and went down the Ohio. When we set off, an Indian in the forward canoe took the scalps of my former friends, strung them on a pole that he placed upon his shoulder, and in that manner carried them, standing in the stern of the canoe, directly before us as we sailed down the river, to the town where the two squaws resided. On our way, we passed a Shawanee town, where I saw a number of heads, arms, legs, and other fragments of the bodies of some white people who had just been burnt. The parts that remained were hanging on a pole which was supported at each end by a crotch stuck in the ground, and were roasted or burnt black as a coal. The fire was yet burning, and the whole appearances afforded a spectacle so shocking that, even to this day, my blood almost curdles in my veins when I think of them. At night we arrived at a small Seneca Indian town, at the mouth of a small river, that was called by the Indians, in the Seneca language, Shinanji, where the two squaws to whom I belonged resided. There we landed, and the Indians went on, which was the last I ever saw of them. Having made fast to the shore, the squaws left me in the canoe while they went to their wigwam or house in the town, and returned with a suit of Indian clothing, all new and very clean and nice. My clothes, though whole and good when I was taken, were now torn in pieces, so that I was almost naked. They first undressed me and threw my rags into the river, then washed me clean and dressed me in the new suit they had just brought, in complete Indian style, and then led me home and seated me in the centre of their wigwam. I had been in that situation but a few minutes before all the squaws in the town came in to see me. I was soon surrounded by them, and they immediately set up a most dismal howling, crying bitterly, and wringing their hands in all the agonies of grief for a deceased relative. Their tears flowed freely, and they exhibited all the signs of real mourning. At the commencement of this scene, one of their number began, in a voice somewhat between speaking and singing, to recite some words to the following purport, and continued the recitation till the ceremony was ended the company at the same time varying the appearance of their countenances, gestures and tone of voice, so as to correspond with the sentiments expressed by their leader. Oh, our brother! Alas, he is dead! He has gone! He will never return! Friendless he died on the field of the slain, where his bones are yet lying unburied. Oh, who will not mourn his sad fate? No tears dropped around him. Oh no, no tears of his sisters were there. He fell in his prime when his arm was most needed to keep us from danger. Alas, he has gone, and left us in sorrow, his loss to be wail. Oh, where is his spirit? His spirit went naked, and hungry it wanders, and thirsty and wounded it groans to return. Oh, helpless and wretched, our brother has gone. No blanket nor food to nourish and warm him, nor candles to light him, nor weapons of war. Oh, none of those comforts had he. But well we remember his deeds, the deer he could take on the chase. The panther shrunk back at the sight of his strength. His enemies fell at his feet. He was brave and courageous in war. As the fawn was harmless, 
His friendship was ardent, his temper was gentle, his pity was great. Oh, our friend, our companion is dead, our brother, your brother, alas, he is gone, but why do we grieve for his loss? In the strength of a warrior, undaunted, he left us to fight by the side of the chiefs. His war whoop was shrill, his rifle well aimed laid his enemies low, his tomahawk drank of their blood, and his knife flayed their scalps while yet covered with gore. And why do we mourn? Though he fell on the field of the slain, with glory he fell, and his spirit went up to the land of his fathers in war. Then why do we mourn? With transports of joy they received him, and fed him, and clothed him, and welcomed him there. O oh, friends, he is happy, then dry up your tears. His spirit has seen our distress, and sent us a helper, whom with pleasure we greet. Dikawamis has come, then let us receive her with joy. She is handsome and pleasant. Oh, she is our sister, and gladly we welcome her here. In the place of our brother she stands in our tribe. With care we will guard her from trouble, and may she be happy till her spirit shall leave us. In the course of that ceremony, from morning they became serene. Joy sparkled in their countenances, and they seemed to rejoice over me as over a long-lost child. I was made welcome amongst them as a sister to the two squaws before mentioned, and was called Dikawamis which being interpreted signifies a pretty girl, a handsome girl, or a pleasant good thing. That is the name by which I have ever since been called by the Indians. I afterwards learned that the ceremony I at that time passed through was that of adoption. The two squaws had lost a brother in Washington's war, sometime in the year before, and in consequence of his death went up to Fort Pitt, on the day on which I arrived there, in order to receive a prisoner or an enemy's scalp, to supply their loss. It is a custom of the Indians, when one of their number is slain or taken prisoner in battle, to give to the nearest relative to the dead or absent, a prisoner if they have chance to take one, and if not, to give him the scalp of an enemy. On the return of the Indians from conquest, which is always announced by peculiar shoutings, demonstrations of joy, and the exhibition of some trophy of victory, the mourners come for ward and make their claims. If they receive a prisoner... It is at their option either to satya to their vengeance by taking his life in the most cruel manner they can conceive of, or to receive and adopt him into the family, in the place of him whom they have lost. All the prisoners that are taken in battle and carried to the encampment or town by the Indians are given to the bereaved families till their number is made good. And unless the mourners have but just received the news of their bereavement and are under the operation of a paroxysm of grief, anger and revenge, or, unless the prisoner is very old, sickly or homely, they generally save him and treat him kindly. But if their mental wound is fresh, their loss so great that they deem it irreparable, or if their prisoner or prisoners do not meet their approbation, no torture, let it be ever so cruel, seems sufficient to make them satisfaction. It is family, and not national, sacrifices amongst the Indians that has given them an indelible stamp as barbarians, and identified their character with the idea which is generally formed of unfeeling ferocity and the most abandoned cruelty. It was my happy lot to be accepted for adoption, and at the time of the ceremony I was received by the two squaws to supply the place of their brother in the family, and I was ever considered and treated by them as a real sister, the same as though I had been born of their mother. During my adoption I sat motionless, nearly terrified to death at the appearance and actions of the company, expecting every moment to feel their vengeance and suffer death on the spot. I was, however, happily disappointed when at the close of the ceremony the company retired, and my sisters went about employing every means for my consolation and comfort. Being now settled and provided with a home, I was employed in nursing the children and doing light work about the house. Occasionally I was sent out with the Indian hunters when they went but a short distance to help them carry their game. My situation was easy. I had no particular hardships to endure. But still, the recollection of my parents, my brothers and sisters, my home and my own captivity destroyed my happiness and made me constantly solitary, lonesome and gloomy. My sisters would not allow me to speak English in their hearing, but remembering the charge that my dear mother gave me at the time I left her, whenever I chanced to be alone I made a business of repeating my prayer, catechism, or something I had learned in order that I might not forget my own language. 
By practicing in that way I retained it till I came to Genesee Flats, where I soon became acquainted with English people with whom I have been almost daily in the habit of conversing. My sisters were diligent in teaching me their language, and to their great satisfaction I soon learned so that I could understand it readily and speak it fluently. I was very fortunate in falling into their hands, for they were kind, good-natured women, peaceable and mild in their dispositions, temperate and decent in their habits and very tender and gentle towards me. I have great reason to respect them, though they have been dead a great number of years. The town where they lived was pleasantly situated on the Ohio, at the mouth of the Shenanji. The land produced good corn, the woods furnished a plenty of game, and the waters abounded with fish. Another river emptied itself into the Ohio, directly opposite the mouth of the Shenanji. We spent the summer at that place, where we planted, hoed, and harvested a large crop of corn of an excellent quality. About the time of corn harvest, Fort Pitt was taken from the French by the English. The corn being harvested, the Indians took it on horses and in canoes, and proceeded down the Ohio, occasionally stopping to hunt a few days, till we arrived at the mouth of Ciota River, where they established their winter quarters, and continued hunting till the ensuing spring in the adjacent wilderness. While at that place, I went with the other children to assist the hunters to bring in their game. The forests on the Ciota were well stocked with elk, deer and other large animals, and the marshes contained large numbers of beaver muskrat, which made excellent hunting for the Indians, who depended, for their meat, upon their success in taking elk and deer, and for ammunition and clothing, upon the beaver, muskrat, and other furs that they could take in addition to their peltry. The season for hunting being passed, we all returned in the spring to the mouth of the river Shenanji, to the houses and fields we had left in the fall before. There we again planted our corn, squashes and beans on the fields that we occupied the preceding summer. About planting time, our Indians all went up to Fort Pitt to make peace with the British and took me with them. We landed on the opposite side of the river from the fort and encamped for the night. Early the next morning the Indians took me over to the fort to see the white people that were there. It was then that my heart bounded to be liberated from the Indians and to be restored to my friends and my country. The white people were surprised to see me with the Indians, enduring the hardships of a savage life at so early an age and with so delicate a constitution as I appeared to possess. They asked me my name, where and when I was taken, and appeared very much interested on my behalf. They were continuing their inquiries when my sisters became alarmed, believing that I should be taken from them, hurried me into their canoe and recrossed the river, took their bread out of the fire and fled with me, without stopping, till they arrived at the river Shenanji. So great was their fear of losing me, or of my being given up in the treaty, that they never once stopped rowing till they got home. Shortly after we left the shore opposite the fort, as I was informed by one of my Indian brothers, the white people came over to take me back, but after considerable inquiry, and having made diligent search to find where I was hid, they returned with heavy hearts. Although I had then been with the Indians something over a year, and had become considerably habituated to their mode of living, and attached to my sisters, the sight of white people who could speak English inspired me with an unspeakable anxiety to go home with them and share in the blessings of civilization. My sudden departure and escape from them seemed like a second captivity, and for a long time I brooded the thoughts of my miserable situation with almost as much sorrow and dejection as I had done those of my first sufferings. Time, the destroyer of every affection, wore away my unpleasant feelings, and I became as contented as before. We tended our cornfields through the summer, and after we had harvested the crop we again went down the river to the hunting ground on the Ciota, where we spent the winter, as we had done the winter before. Early in the spring we sailed up the Ohio River, to a place that the Indians called Wishto, where one river emptied into the Ohio on one side, and another on the other. At that place the Indians built a town, and we planted corn. We lived three summers at Wishto, and spent each winter on the Ciota. The first summer of our living at Wishto, a party of Delaware Indians came up the river, took up their residence and lived in common with us. They brought five white prisoners with them, who by their conversation made my situation much more agreeable, as they could all speak English. I have forgotten the names of all of them except one, which was Priscilla Ramsey. 
She was a very handsome, good-natured girl and was married soon after she came to Wishto to Capt. Little Billy's uncle, who went with her on a visit to her friends in the States. Having tarried with them as long as she wished to, she returned with her husband to Kana Atua, where he died. She, after his death, married a white man by the name of Nettles, and now lives with him, if she is living, on Grand River, Upper Canada. Not long after the Delawares came to live with us at Wishto, my sisters told me that I must go and live with one of them, whose name was Sheninji. Not daring to cross them or disobey their commands, with a great degree of reluctance I went, and Sheninji and I were married according to Indian custom. Sheninji was a noble man, large in stature, elegant in his appearance, generous in his conduct, courageous in war, a friend to peace and a great lover of justice. He supported a degree of dignity far above his rank and merited and received the confidence and friendship of all the tribes with whom he was acquainted. Yet Sheninji was an Indian. The idea of spending my days with him at first seemed perfectly irreconcilable to my feelings, but his good nature, generosity, tenderness and friendship towards me soon gained my affection and, strange as it may seem, I loved him. To me he was ever kind in sickness and always treated me with gentleness. In fact, he was an agreeable husband and a comfortable companion. We lived happily together till the time of our final separation, which happened two or three years after our marriage, as I shall presently relate. In the second summer of my living at Wishto, I had a child at the time that the kernels of corn first appeared on the cob. When I was taken sick, Sheninji was absent, and I was sent to a small shed on the bank of the river, which was made of boughs where I was obliged to stay till my husband returned. My two sisters, who were my only companions, attended me, and on the second day of my confinement my child was born, but it lived only two days. It was a girl, and notwithstanding the shortness of the time that I possessed it, it was a great grief to me to lose it. After the birth of my child I was very sick, but was not allowed to go into the house for two weeks, when, to my great joy, Sheninji returned, and I was taken in, and as comfortably provided for as our situation would admit of, my disease continued to increase for a number of days, and I became so far reduced that my recovery was despaired of by my friends, and I concluded that my troubles would soon be finished. At length, however, my complaint took a favourable turn, and by the time that the corn was ripe I was able to get about. I continued to gain my health, and in the fall was able to go to our winter quarters on the Shiota with the Indians. From that time, nothing remarkable occurred to me till the fourth winter of my captivity, when I had a son born while I was at Siota. I had a quick recovery, and my child was healthy. To commemorate the name of my much-lamented father, I called my son Thomas Jemison.